Town, People v. Kassab, case number 2023-286-132-FH. Jason DeSantis of the People, Your Honor, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Judge. I'm pleased to court Mitchell the Bittler on behalf of Gavin Kassab. He is present. Please state your name for the record. Gavin Anthony Kassab, Your Honor. Thank you. And, sir, do you understand you raised the date and time for your sentencing? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. Mr. Bittler, sir, have you had an opportunity to review the PSI with your client? I have, Your Honor. Any additions you wish to make corrections? Judge, we did file a sentencing memorandum, and we did address the sentencing information report relative to the guidelines. And I've discussed this matter with Mr. DeSantis, and it appears that we're on the same page for three of the offense variables, that being offense variable one, offense variable two. I don't want to misspeak, but I believe those are to be scored at zero. That's correct, Judge. Those are for aggravated use of a weapon. The case law is very clear. If it's going to be a car, it pretty much has to be something that's like an intentional act of assault. I reviewed case law. I attached it to my sentencing memorandum, so I agree those should be at zero. The other one in which we were in agreement on was OB-19. It was scored at 15 points. It should be scored at 10 points. Agreed. But we do not agree on OB-14. Correct. OB-14 is 10 points assessed for leadership role. And as we indicated in our sentencing memorandum, Mr. Kassab was not a leader in this matter. Mr. Kahn procured the vehicle. Mr. Kahn was driving the vehicle. Mr. Kahn was in control of the vehicle. Mr. Kahn made the decisions to do what he did, resulting in a tragic and unfortunate death and injury to everybody. So I'm suggesting to the court that that OB should be scored zero because Mr. Kassab was not a leader. Thank you. With regard to OB-1 at zero, OB-2 at zero, OB-19 at 10, those are all stipulations. Correct. Correct. With regard to OB-14? That's the dispute. And Mr. DeSantis, sir, please go ahead with your position. Judge, my position is that I think you saw the video of this incident the defendant was taking while it was ongoing. You heard the driver in this case basically see decision-making authority as they approached the red light to the defendant. They said, what should we do? The defendant says, go, go, go. And then I believe he says, go, go, go again, at which point the engine very clearly revs. At this point, you have someone asking for instruction, being provided that instruction, and then complying with that instruction. And they think that tracks when you consider the comparative ages where you have a minor driving a vehicle and an adult in the passenger seat giving instructions. Anything further? Actually, Mr. Kassab says that he was the person whose voice is what should we do as opposed to Mr. Kahn saying that. Can you speak up? I can't hear you. Yes, Your Honor. Mr. Kassab indicates and states that the person said what should we do was Mr. Kassab. It wasn't Mr. Kahn. So for whatever that's worth, I'm asking you to take that into consideration. Okay. With regard to OB-14, the court is satisfied, sir, that you were in the leadership position. You were the adult in the situation, number one, with regard to whether the minor that was in the car needed direction. There was a request for the Google Maps. What should we do? Where should we go? And even after the incident, sir, when both of the parties climbed out of the roof, certainly you were leading with regard to the fleeing as well. The court is satisfied with regard to OB-14. I'm going to keep it as it's scored. And just for the record, Judge, of course, that does not affect the guideline scoring, but it's just to be clear. Okay. Agent Ortiz, there's no differential in the guidelines? No change in the guidelines, Judge. No change in the recommendation. But we will add that jail credit has gone up to 350 days. Thank you. Mr. DeSantis, sir, have you an opportunity to review the PSI? Judge? Yes, sir. I have other things to say about the PSI. I was just addressing the sentencing information report. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. With respect to CF, and I might have mentioned this in the sentencing memo, but I just want to make it clear for the record. With respect to CFJ-284 on page 2, under the heading pre-sentence investigation, that first line that says the defendants drove a rental car through Wall Lake jurisdiction. The defendants didn't drive the car. Mr. Kahn drove the car. So I think that should be corrected because this is plural. There's only one driver. Judge, 
I would say this is an aiding and abetting case, so they're being held liable for the same activity. So I think defendants drove the car is appropriate, but it's a nuanced difference. Also in that same paragraph, Judge, uh, one, two, three, approximately four lines down from the top, same page, states uh, there is evidence the defendants were recording the police chase for social media. That is not correct. The uh, uh, video was never posted anywhere. The video was never live streamed. Uh, it was being recorded, but was not for purposes of disseminating it on social media. So uh, if it reads as evidence that uh, the, the defendant was recording the police chase, yes, but it was not for purposes of social media. I, I guess I don't know exactly what purpose was, but if the reason it wasn't posted, at least after the fact, was because they left the phone behind and it was taken. Okay, um, with regard to the information that it was to be posted on social media, is that just a hypothesis? I, I think so, Judge. I'll, I'll strike that. Uh, again, Your Honor, um, CFJ 284 on page 6. Um, it indicates that Gavin, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, approximately uh, nine, line, 9 paragraphs down. Well, Judge, at this point, this is actually a section from a victim's statement, so I don't think there's any ability to really alter or change it. That's what the victim stated. Okay. I just want to make clear for the record that there's some misinformation, but I guess we can address that after the victims make their impact statement. Um, So basically all the other issues I had with the pre-sentence investigation report would relate and will relate to uh, what the victims have related to the probation department. So with that, I don't have anything else about the pre-sentence report. Okay. Ms. Rivers, you're done with your corrections. Um, I will still give you an opportunity to allocate after. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. DeSantis, have you had an opportunity to give I? I have, Judge. Um, I only have one additional correction. Um, it's on page. It's on CFJ 284, page five, um, just below halfway, right above. It's the last paragraph uh, above consecutive sentences. It indicates that the co-defendant was not ultimately charged from this incident. That's incorrect. There were charges issued for the other, for the driver of this incident. Okay. Thank you. 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 Do you know what the charges are? They're the same. Same charges. When were they issued? Same time. I'm not sure what here is there. Thank you. And just for the court's edification, uh, Mr. Khan has entered a plea of no contest to all the charges in the other court. Thank you. Um, with regard to any changes to Agent Ortiz? I have the jail credit. Anything else that's going to change? There's no other changes, Judge, but I didn't get what your ruling was on the um, argument regarding defendants. Um, the defendants were driving through. Were we leaving that, striking that? You can leave that. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Judge. Okay. Um, with regard to victims? Judge, I believe we're going to have two statements today, if that's all right. Yes. Um, it's from both of the parents of Piper Brothers. Um, Eric Brothers is also in the accident. She was injured. She's requesting that she make her statement seated. I was just going to give her my seat if that's Absolutely. all right. Uh, but I think I'm not sure who's coming up. William Crothers. Piper's father. I'm going to try and get through this as best I can. I've thought about this entire year plus <clears throat> and what I might say, and this has been an excruciatingly long process, process still with challenges ahead. thought how awful this entire situation has been, how much sleep we have lost, and really there's no way to describe how awful losing Piper or how awful our loss continues to feel for me and my family. I continue thinking of that day, the absence of Piper at our dinner table and our regular activities will always disturb me. And tending to Cora and Erica's recovery continue, is continuing, continues to be challenging. 
Piper was a wonderful, smart, and energetic young girl, extremely talkative, friendly, and talented, accomplished figure skater and solo ice dancer. She chose to remain with the online school program after experiencing it during COVID. She found online learning to be less distracting and all around better her, for her learning style. Always very determined to complete her work and stay ahead, she had her eighth grade curriculum complete in March, determined to start her summer break early. Piper worked very hard on her schoolwork and she was named to the eighth grade honor roll for her hard work. Having success with the online program, Piper had already made the decision to continue with the program through high school, and I was looking forward to having her company at my shop while she continued her next four years of high school. She was clearly on track to create an exciting life and had a bright future ahead of her, a life she was making big plans for and deserved to live, a future ahead of her I was most excited to see but was cut short by the actions of Gavin Kassab. That evening, Erica called me frantically explaining they were hit while crossing the intersection at Decker and Maple Roads. I assumed an accident, but at that point I had no idea just how horrific things were to turn out. Her voice on the phone gave much indication of how fearful and dire the situation was, but it was hard to absorb at the time. She told me Piper was being taken to Henry Ford Hospital in, West Bloom, in Bloomfield Hills and instructed me to meet her there. I left work immediately and arrived at the hospital before her ambulance. It took quite some time for her ambulance to arrive, which worried me as I imagined how severe things may have been. Plus, the accident was not far from the hospital. Once she arrived, they worked on her for what seemed like an eternity. I was kept separate from where the doctors worked, having no idea her condition or status. From what I could hear, they were working frantically to save her life. After probably 30 minutes, they allowed me in to see her as they continued life-saving measures. Injuries sustained were too severe for her to survive. Broken femur, shattered pelvis, among other massive internal injuries too numerous and awful to list. You have to, <clears throat> I have some. This is a photo of her Chromebook from the vehicle accident. That is a metal Chromebook computer, which in the crash, which was in the crash and gives you an approximation of the forces Piper, Cora, and Erica's body had to endure when struck by a 5,000 pound gladiator traveling at 98 miles an hour while running from the police down Maple Roads, a section with a 35 mile an hour speed limit. During this time, I received other calls from Erica with updates on her and Cora's status. The hospital they were taken to uh, and later decisions by Novi Providence to transfer Cora to Children's Hospital in downtown Detroit, separating Erica from Cora. I was still with Piper at the time and faced with the worst decision of my life, doctors telling me they were unable to revive Piper, witnessing her passing away before my eyes and having to leave Piper to catch up with Cora to ensure I didn't lose both, which at the time, felt like a very real and terrifying possibility. Too distraught after losing Piper, I called my friend Evan Evans to take me to catch up with Cora. At that point, it was unclear how life-threatening Cora's injuries were, but it was evident this was no ordinary accident and much more severe than I could have thought possible. We arrived at Children's Hospital later that night where they performed several examinations further worked and further worked overnight to assess and stabilize Cora. Her injuries were shocking, damaged nearly beyond recognition, multiple skull fractures, ligament damage, eye injuries, lacerations, impact damage to her entire face, cuts and bruises, along with blood clots and bleeds in her brain, all endangering her life. 
She was completely unconscious during this time and could not wake or speak. They monitored and examined Cora for around 5 a.m., until around 5 a.m. This is a photo of Cora. Get a good look at that. After hours of assessment, the doctors at Children's Hospital recommended her to be transferred to Royal Oak Beaumont for further and specialized treatment for her eye damage, facial damage, and head injuries. They stated Cora would require special surg surgical expertise for her injuries with particular concern over the damage to her right eye, the right side of her face and eye. The Children's Hospital the doctors at Children's Hospital were not equipped to handle injuries as extreme and complex as hers and explained the specialists in Royal Oak would be necessary. Children's Hospital made arrangements for us to be moved to Royal Oak Beaumont. Soon after getting to Royal Oak Beaumont, Cora was prepped for emergency surgery to do initial prepare, repairs to her eye and facial damage damage. We remained <clears throat> at Royal Oak Beaumont for two weeks under the round-the-clock care from a great team of doctors and nurses. Her neurologist monitored and treated her injuries, which included a blood clot bleed in her, and bleed in her brain, brain trauma, skull fractures, head and neck trauma. Her eye surgical specialist monitored her eye and facial damage several times a day, along with other doctors and nurses who cared for her injuries. Cora required round o'clock care in the months following her hospital stay. This included administration of injected medication to treat her blood clot, along with many follow-up visits to monitor her blood clot and bleed with various MRI, MRV, and MRV scans and blood testing. Visits to her neuro neurologist and other specialists to monitor her injuries continued throughout the summer. One officer who responded to the crash, seen in later hearings, described Cora's condition as gruesome, with her blood covering with blood covering her face and body in the street, as she was initially screaming in pain after the crash. Piper being pinned to the vehicle was unable to move. I want to be sure that the court and public are aware of a few things that emphasize just how careless and dangerous Gavin Kassab is. Gavin at the time of the crash was on bond from the court for pending assault charges. Under continuing investigation for sex and computer crimes, a search of his house was executed just days before the crash. Yet. He was still out that night, continuing his patterns of very risky and careless behavior, allowing an unlicensed person to drive and causing chaos in our city. Previously known for having weapons in Wild Lake Central High School, his record of bad behavior goes way back. Recording the chase and escalating the situation for his own amusement, making clear directives to the driver, Aslan Khan, quoting Gavin himself, go, 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 forward, forward, go, go. Doing all he could to get away and avoid responsibility or being stopped and caught. At that time, he knew he could not have another, yet another police contact while on bond. Having lived in this area for many years, I imagine Gavin traveled down that section of Maple Road many times and was aware how tight and often congested the area is around that time of night, and the speed limit being only 35 miles an hour. The vehicle computer logged a speed of 98 miles an hour crossing into the intersection. After the collision, one could clearly see how severe the situation was, with multiple vehicles severely damaged, yet Gavin showing no compassion for anyone who might be injured or killed by his actions, thinking only of himself continued running away on foot that night. His careless attitude towards the safety of others led him to kill Piper, or led him to killing Piper and nearly half my family that night. As if leaving my family to die in that intersection wasn't shocking enough, a show of how little care and compassion he has for others. He and his family 
left for a Florida vacation a mere three days after killing Piper. There is no way in this day and age of social media that they were not aware of the seriousness of this crash and Piper's death prior to leaving for vacation. He may have thought he was fast enough to get away with her murder that night, but he was mistaken. Earlier, the court granted his request for out-of-state travel on March 7, 2023. Between that time and leaving for his vacation, his home was raided for evidence in his sex abuse case. He caused a serious crash, nearly killing half my family, yet, to my knowledge, did not update the court on any of his mounting legal issues or new pending charges prior to leaving for his vacation. They simply left. People who operate this way have no place in civil society. His running that night resulted in a further 50 days for our system to arrest Gavin for what he did that night. 50 days of freedom, a vacation for him and his family while, he, while we planned and held Piper's funeral and I continued to tend to Cora and Erica's recovery needs. These were extremely painful and fearful days for my fam me and my family, not knowing if anyone would be held responsible for killing my daughter Piper and nearly half my family that night, or what unknown dangers we felt faced with her killer still roaming free. On May 11th, we got our first contact from Karen McDonald's office, a phone call 50 days since that phone call was 50 days since the crash, telling us they planned to arrest two people who they thought were involved in the crash to tell us Gavin's first hearing would be the following day and assign our victim's advocate. In that hearing on May 12th, Gavin was fi finally identified to us and the prosecutor explained his role in causing the crash. He was issued a $250,000 bond and Gavin uh, bond. Gavin's family posted that bond as they had in the past, even though claiming financial hardship. And arrangements were made for him to be released from jail before we even left the parking lot of the 52nd District Court that day. An incredibly defeating day for us, knowing this dangerous individual would continue to roam our community. His family, as in the past, continuing to ensure his actions would have no, absolutely no consequence for him. This was a very painful and frightening for us. Having to live in fear for ourselves and community, knowing Gavin was released yet again while I continued tending to Cora and Erica's recovery. Various TikToks Gavin posted, depending on how you might interpret them, seemed to indicate he believed he was above the law mocked the police or thought himself otherwise untouchable, further frightening us. Gavin's sex and computer charges were finally brought later in May, along with them adding manslaughter and reckless driving counts to our case. The court now seeing a more complete picture of just how dangerous and awful he is, issued bonds of 750000 for that case and in later hearings showing portions of his own video along with other evidence, the court increased the bond for killing Piper and injuring Cora and Erica to 750000 finally holding him in custody. Our loss in this process continues to bring stress and strain and agony to our lives, more so than I can explain here. Erica's continuing physical pain along with the damage I still see to Cora's face from the crash and the loss of Piper are things I can hardly cope with, knowing I will never celebrate a wedding for Piper and walk her down the aisle, never see her graduate from college, never see her graduate from high school, never s saw her complete middle school, and will never see her again. Cora has lost an older sibling. Older siblings demonstrate and navigate life out ahead of you. This is an, a, a miserable <clears throat> benefit Cora has now lost a sister and lifelong companion she will now grow up without. We already can see the effects this loss is having on Cora, often looking more lonely now without her sister's company. 
A few days ago, Piper would have celebrated her 15th birthday if her life <clears throat> was not taken from her at only 13 years old in an awful and extremely painful act caused by Gavin Kassab. Gavin currently faces 65 years in prison for killing my daughter and seriously injuring Cora and my wife, Erica. In the crash that he caused, which changed our life forever that night, the calculations for sentencing appear very complex. And we were under the impression these charges would be applied in a way that would cause most, if not all, to be served consecutively. It turns out that not to be as true as we once believed. In any case, I would ask the court to impose a minimum of 50 of those years mandatory, one year for each day he spent free running from the crash he caused, along with the possibility of more. To be honest, I would prefer he not be allowed back into society until I am long dead, if ever. I also hope, in the event he is convicted for his sex and computer crimes, any sentence imposed in that case, our cases are served consecutively, so the value of Piper's loss and his punishment for his actions causing her death are not diluted by his other crimes. Gavin has demonstrated he is an habitual offender, and his crimes should be treated as such. I have several other reasons for requesting the most extreme punishment to be rendered on Gavin Kassab. I hope the court recognizes our case was clearly undercharged from the beginning. Criminals committing similar crimes while running from the police are more often and more quickly charged with second degree murder. Several similar crimes, three happening just in the time he has been accused, have all been charged at a level of second degree murder rather than just first degree fleeing and later adding manslaughter. I still struggle to understand why more serious charges were not applied for Piper after being told by several law enforcement that this was second degree murder all day long. Throughout this process, I have taken my responsibility to prevent further tragedy in our community very seriously. And Gavin, clearly in more cases than I can mention, dating back years, has demonstrated time and time again that he is a very dangerous individual without any care for innocent people around him. Several police officials who have spoken us characterize Gavin as terrorizing the commerce community for years. Individually dangerous and enabled by his family, a deadly individual. I believe Gavin has the capacity and motivation for to cause further tragedies in our community and I hope the court sees this as clearly as I do and delivers justice for Piper and my family. To Gavin. Should you choose to speak, please save your apologies for someone else. Your no contest plea means nothing more to me than to confirm you even now refuse to accept responsibility for what you did that night. No one who did what you did that night deserves anything less than whatever the maximum punishment I can beg this court for. Regarding your own careless act and leaving the evidence behind, I'm sure is your biggest regret. I thought I had my life all figured out. My last two children and online programs would be safe from any <clears throat> school issues similar to Oxford or others. Then one who previously had weapons problems in school comes along with another <clears throat> whose mother gives free access to her vehicles and both of you turn around and use it to kill my daughter and nearly half my family. Loaded ourselves into my Honda Fit and headed home to eat dinner, 
finish any homework, and prepare to tuck ourselves into bed for the night. We took our normal route, which was heading directly north on Novi Decker Road toward our home in Commerce Township. Little did we suspect how our lives would dramatically change in the next few minutes. Unbeknownst to us, Gavin and his friend Aguan were out joyriding in a rented Jeep Gladiator. After the police had tried to pull them over, they fled from the police. The end result was that my daughter Piper was killed, and both myself and my daughter Cora were seriously injured. Unfortunately for my family, Gavin has shown a complete disregard for the law and for the safety of the people around him. When this accident happened, he was out on bond from a previous assault and battery offense. That it should have been his first wake up call to change his actions. When this accident happened, uh, a warrant had been issued and his house had been searched just five days before the crash. A second sign to change his actions and the path he was on. However, instead of Gavin changing the path and his life was on, he, his willful disregard for the law and the health and happiness of other people continued. Gavin chose to get into the vehicle and go for a ride with his friend, an unlicensed driver. The first sign on the night of March 22nd, they had no regard for the law. Gavin and Aslan chose to run when the police officer turned on their lights, signaling them to stop. The action was not only a violation of law, but an outright defiance of the police. Gavin, on video, encouraged Aslan to speed away from the officers, reaching a speed of 98 miles an hour, more than 60 miles an hour over the 35 mile per hour speed limit, a clear disregard for the law and a direction from an officer. Laughter was heard on the video while Gavin and Aslan ran away from the officers and approached the intersection of Maple and Decker showing no remorse for the unlawful actions they were engaged in. Gavin encouraged Aslan to go through the red light at the intersection of Maple and Decker, a traffic light that had been red in the direction for a significant amount of time. Again, not showing even consideration for the vehicles and the lives of the people around them. Additionally, after the crash happened, Gavin ran from the scene again showing no compassion for the shattered lives and for the devastation that was caused from his actions. While Gavin was running, police and emergency vehicles were arriving on scene to assist with the medical needs of my family and others. While Gavin was running, they were loading up the limp body of my daughter Piper into an ambulance, and my husband was rushing to the hospital to meet her as I held out hope for her well-being. While Gavin was running, they pulled my daughter Cora on a stretcher and into an ambulance. She was being rushed to the hospital and I climbed into the ambulance with her using all the effort I could muster since I was also injured so I'd not have to be separated from her too. While Gavin was continuing to evade the police, my daughter Piper died from her injuries in the hospital and Cora was moved to her second and third hospital because they could not handle the extent of her injuries at the first two emergency rooms. Well, Gavin left on his vacation with his family. Cora and I were still being treated in two different hospitals for injuries, and Piper was already in the morgue. Well, Gavin had fun on his vacation. Cora was being treated for her injuries due to the crash. She was in the pediatric ICU where she had received surgery to repair her eye injuries. At the same time, the specialists at the hospital were debating whether to treat the blood clot in her brain or her brain bleed first, as they were opposing treatments. About the time Gavin and his family had returned from their vacation after days of fun, I was being released from the hospital to go home. There, I would be cared for by family and friends who had rushed into town from many different locations both in-state and out-of-state. This was the due to the fact that I could not care for myself yet, and my husband was still attending to our daughter Cora around the clock at the pediatric ICU, all a direct result from the actions of Gavin and Aslan. Well, Gavin still did not have charges against him in this case, due to the fact that he ran from the scene, I was trying to get stronger so I would no longer need assistance going the 15 feet from my chair in the living room to the bathroom while using a walker. While Gavin still did not have charges against him in our case, Cora was released 
from the hospital. While Gavin still did not have charges in her case, Cora was at her home, either sleeping most of the day on a good day. However, on a bad day, you could find her throwing up from the headaches caused from the brain injury sustained in the crash, the injuries that she was receiving daily shots to treat. While Gavin still did not have charges against him in our case, we had the funeral for our daughter, Piper. After Gavin was released on bond and posting his rendition of Murder on his, My Mind to his TikTok account, which I sent to the prosecutors, my family was at home feeling anxious. Since Gavin's incarceration, my family has been working toward getting our lives back to our new normal. I have attended physical therapy sessions two to three times a week, spanning nine months. I am still attending grief therapy to be able to deal with the loss of Piper. I am also receiving therapy in order to address my anxiety, PTSD, depression, and insomnia caused by this horrific event. Due to these conditions, I still do not feel safe. it's safe for me to drive. I have not been able to return to the intersection of Maple and Decker, and Piper's room still remains closed and untouched inside of our home. I have returned to work, but only half time, and I'm working from home due to the pain in my back, neck, and shoulder. Also, the anxiety, depression, and insomnia and exhaustion makes it difficult working a full day of work. Since I have not felt safe driving since the accident, it has made it difficult on our family and has put an additional burden on my husband since he now needs to drive us both wherever we need to go. We understand there's no way to see Piper again or have the experience any normal parent would have. We can no longer tell her how proud we are of her or even that we love her. We no longer get to watch and enjoy experiences like her first day of high school, her first day at homecoming prom, high school graduation, first day of college, her college graduation, her wedding, or even meeting our grandchildren for the first time. There were so many opportunities for Gavin to choose a different path. However, with each choice presented to him, he continued to ignore the choices that showed respect for the law and the public around him. He could have chosen not to go out that night, seeing as he was on bond and his home had just been recently searched in connection to his other case. He could have chosen not to get into the vehicle with the unlicensed driver. He could have advocated for pulling over for the police instead of fleeing. He could have shown an ounce of respect for others' lives by not encouraging Aslan to go through a red light. It took the death of my daughter Piper and him in jail in order to get the chain of criminal actions to stop and insanity that started long before the police officers turned on their lights to pull them over. For this, I believe that Gavin is a danger to the general public and that he should be given the maximum sentence due to the horrific nature of his crime and to make sure that something like this never happens again. We all know that he was definitely a danger to our family and anyone at that intersection that night. The warning signs were there for him and those around him to see. He could have made different choices long before Piper was killed. He just chose not to. Thank you. Thank you, others. Mr. DeSantis, do you have any other victims? Judge, I'm, I'm not going to add too much more about what the family has gone through, but I did want to draw the attention to the letters the court has received um, from the community, and in particular, uh, that's what I want to talk about is the wide-ranging impacts this has had beyond just this family. Um, and I think it's highlighted best, perhaps, in the letter um, sent by Jeff Coyle, um, who was one of the uh, firefighters and paramedics who responded that day. I think that letter really shows the court how much this has an impact on other people as well. Um, this is a family that's been destroyed. It's never going to be the same. Um, and I think this court sentence should reflect the severity of that and also the fact that there was a, a juvenile involved in this. And I think some of this done at the behest or leading or urging or, or example setting um, from the defendant. I don't think that should go un unappreciated or under address as well. I wanted to give anybody else who wanted an opportunity to speak um, the opportunity to do so. I know that we have people who are on Zoom as well. Is there anybody who's on Zoom who's a victim who would like to make a statement? Mr. Rabinowitz, sir? 
Thank you, Judge. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Judge. Afternoon, ma'am. Julie Musial Woods. Thank you. I did submit this via email, and I wanted to make sure that if I got the opportunity to read it, I could. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, so I put this communication is in regards to the aforementioned case. Please allow me to share with you about Piper Cora and Erica. I've had the privilege of knowing their family since 2015 when my son discovered the sport of inline speed skating. Piper and Cora were skating at the ages of four and two. The family welcomed my son, myself, and my older son into the Wolverines family, and they became great friends of our family. Cora and Piper were either skating team practices or riding with their mom, Erica, being pulled by her on a bike. I've spent almost every major holiday with this family in addition to indoor nationals for inline speed skating for several years. Piper was what I always thought of as a future Olympian. She skated with grace and had an amazing work ethic. She commonly made our teammates laugh by saying things to us like, if you did what coach tells you, you would be better by now. I trusted her, <laughs> oh, excuse me. I trusted her and her skating abilities more than I trusted my own skating abilities. She was extremely smart, kind, and was a natural born leader. Piper was an extremely accomplished speed, speed skater and ice skater and had many podium appearances in both sports. She had finished her online school for the year months ahead of schedule before her life was taken. She was an outstanding role model for her sister Cora her life ended as a result of the actions of the defendant. A 13-year-old girl, big sister, little sister, daughter, niece, and granddaughter that was beloved by many had her life ended due to the defendant consciously running away from the police. This family was on their way home for figure skating practice. They were innocently happy on following traffic laws in an area where the speed limit is 35 miles an hour we were, they were hit by the defendant going 98 miles per hour. This was amazing family had Piper's life ripped away by the irresponsible behavior of the defendant, as well as experiencing irrepar irreparable mental anguish over the loss and injuries made by this terror to society. My friend Erica has not been able to drive a car since the crash. My friend has not only lost a child, but she has health issues that stem from the incident that the defendant to this day still refuses to take, take responsibility for. This loss has continuously, uh, I'm sorry, this loss has continuously disrespected by the defendant. Not only did he record the crime, but he encouraged a minor to break multiple laws, fled the scene, and then went on a family vacation to Florida for two weeks. He was not held accountable for his actions, it was not detained until 50 days after the days of the incident. 50 days of freedom allowed after this tragic loss of life is despicable and embarrassing for our judicial system. The defendant was allowed on bail when he should not have been. I am imploring you to use the justice system to send this criminal to the fullest extent of the law. Per the plea hearing, the fullest extent of the law should be 65 years. Anything less is criminal. He has another active case, and I have the case numbers cited, but I'm sure you're aware of it, and has multiple district court cases. And he was avoiding being caught in the violation of the 2023-230030OM for assault and battery case when, while encouraging a 15-year-old to run red lights, run from the police, and then elude the police for over a month. He went on vacation while my friends had to pick up the pieces of their lives after he destroyed the lives of all of them. He clearly shows no remorse for his actions, has blatant disrespect for the law, and won't accept responsibility for his actions. 
I am convinced that he will not have to properly accept responsibility unless he is sentenced to the maximum penalty possible as allowed by the law. Thank you. Anybody else? Mr. I don't believe so, Judge. Uh, Mr. Bitterwitzer. <coughs> Judge, is really, really nothing that can be said because this is a, a horrific and tragic event and nothing's going to bring Piper back. Hopefully her memory be a blessing for the community and for her family. Uh, Gavin Kassab and his family extend their uh, sympathies and condolences to the Carruthers family. Uh, we're not here to litigate this matter, Judge. However, I'd be remiss if I didn't address a couple of things that were said by the victims with their impact statement. Uh, Deputy Michael David, who actually was president of the courtroom who did the accident reconstruction, uh, testified that the car was traveling, the car driven by Aslan Khan was traveling 72 miles an hour, not 98 miles an hour. Not that it makes a difference, not that it excuses anybody's behavior, but the record should be straight that it was 72, not 98. In addition, the language about Gavin saying forward, forward, and also laughter. I've viewed this tape over a hundred times. There's nothing on this tape where Gavin Kassab is saying forward, forward, and there's nothing on the tape regarding laughter. Um, in addition, there's, there's no evidence that Gavin encouraged Khan to drive through a red light. If you take a look at the facts of the case, Gavin is filming the police behind him in a side view mirror. He's not even looking at the road. I would even know there's a red light. So there's no evidence that he encouraged him. Gavin accepts responsibility for his behavior. Everybody says he doesn't, but he did. We didn't go to trial. I talked to Gavin about potentially trying this case on the reckless driving causing death and the manslaughter because I thought there might be some legal issues there that a jury might consider and might find him not guilty. But he didn't want to put this family through the misery and the pain and the suffering. So he took a plea, and he avoided further harm to this family. In federal court, which I do a lot of federal work, if someone comes and accepts responsibility for their behavior, they are given a reduction in the sentence guidelines. They're generally given three-point reduction in the sentence guidelines. It's a different point system. But the government acknowledges that someone who comes in and accepts responsibility for their behavior should at least get some credit for it. And I'm asking you to consider giving Mr. Kassab Gavin some credit for the fact that he avoided wasting the taxpayers' money and he avoided trying to inflict any further damage or harm to the Carruthers family. This case has been pending for quite some time. And I have met with Gavin on many, many occasions. And he's always expressed remorse. He's always expressed the fact that He's very, very sorry for what happened. It does not reduce his culpability or what he did, the harm that he brought, but I'm asking the court to take into consideration that he, Mr. Kassab, Gavin Kassab, was not driving the vehicle. Gavin Kassab was not the one that had the physical control over the vehicle. Gavin Kassab didn't have his foot on the accelerator. He didn't have his hands on the steering wheel. He wasn't the one that made the decision to run through a red light or ignore a red light. I'm asking you to take that into consideration, Your Honor. I'm asking that you fashion a sentence that is sufficient but not greater than necessary to accomplish the goals of sentencing. Yeah, everybody wants to paint this young man as a monster. He's not. We presented 20, 30 letters to the court regarding this young man, his history, who he is, his family background, and the family support and community support. Uh, he was at the time a 19-year-old young man, immature, as indicated. He was also in some type of treatment because of this immaturity, because of some mental issues. So I'm asking you to take that into consideration. <coughs> Probation department is asking for the top of the guidelines. I'm asking you to consider something less than top of the guidelines because as an aider or better, he didn't make the decision to run through 
the red light, and he avoided pain and suffering for the family. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Kassab, sir. First and foremost, I apologize. First and foremost, I apologize to the Carruthers family, all the victims, and the community for their terrible loss and the harm I have caused. I send my deepest condolences and sympathies to the families. Every day I think of Piper Carruthers, Piper and her family. Every day I pray for the soul of Piper and the well-being of the Carruthers family. I accept responsibility for my actions. I am truly remorseful for my conduct and behavior. While I have been incarcerated, I reconnected with God, I meet with the priest, attend services, I read the Bible and pray the rosary every day. I pray the Carruthers family will soften their hearts so they may forgive me for my sins. I pray that God will forgive me. I promise and pledge when I am returned to the community, I will be a law-abiding citizen and contribute positively to the community. Once again, I sincerely apologize to the Carruthers family, all the victims in the community. Thank you, Your Honor, for allowing me to speak. Thank you, sir. Agent Ortiz, the family has spoken several times about the guidelines of being 65 years. I'm not sure where that's coming from. Um, Judge, I can address that. Right. Um, Your Honor, the combined total of all the charges issued would be 65 years. Um, there is a statement or a line in the uh, general information, the first count, that would allow for the manslaughter charge, for example be run consecutive for each death that occurs, not for each you know, injury or charge that occurs. So I think that's where the, the misunderstanding comes from. Um, and with regard to the charging, there's an indication uh, that with regard to the charging, the family was not happy with the charging. The charging came from the prosecutor's office. That's right. Okay. And that was after consultation, I take it, with the family? There were charges initially issued. There was consultation with the family. There was additional charges issued. And the maximum possible, Agent Ortiz? It's 15 years, Your Honor, on counts one through three, and 10 years on counts four and five. Mr. Kassab, sir, did you hear the statements that were made by the victims? Yes, Your Honor. And, sir, did you hear them talking about the path that you were on? Yes, Your Honor. Reminds me of a saying, if you continue on the same path, you'll end up in the direction that you're going. So you've ended up there. The harm that you've done to the community is unfathomable. The amount of opportunities that you had to retreat and to tell the driver to retreat, you never did. After the crash, I watched the video, you can hear the people screaming and crying in pain while you're running and taking away resources and the people who could have helped the victims because they chased you. This would add it on top of all of the other instances that you previously had leading up to this behavior. On count one, sir, homicide manslaughter with motor vehicle guidelines are 50 to 100, sir, eight years to 15 years in prison, 350 days credit. Count two, police officer fleeing first degree, 50 to 100 months, sir, 8 to 15 years in prison, 350 days credit. Count three, reckless driving, causing death. Guidelines are 50 to 100, 8 years to 15 years with 350 days credit. Counts four and five, police officer fleeing, second degree, five years to 10 years, 350 days credit. Sir, the state costs are $340. Crime Victim Right Fund is $130. You're not to have any contact or association with the Crothers family. Your vehicle is immobilized mandatorily pursuant to the statute um, as related to count three. Um, sir, the fact that you would videotape and the fact that you would just continue to increase the harm to the community is unacceptable. Anything further? Judge, there is one matter. Um, I did inform counsel there was going to be a restitution request. I'm not sure why it wasn't addressed in the PSI. Um, the number I have been given um, for unreimbursed expenses is $120,778.15. I did communicate that number to Mr. Rabit where I believe he's going to be asking for a restitution hearing. So I wanted to indicate to the court that we will get together with the court and pick a date for that. 
That's Andrew. We respect the request on the restitution here. Okay. We can work together with regard to a hearing on the restitution. Sir, this has been your sentencing. You have a right to appeal your sentencing. You have 42 days to file an advice of rights form with this court. If you do wish to appeal, if you cannot afford a lawyer, the court will appoint one for you. Matters concluded. Thank you, Judge. All rise.